Caesar Lectureship and uh, the Organic Chemistry at Harvard, and most recently the Dauber Lectureship at Berkeley in Organic Chemistry. And I think that's a real uh, tribute to her contributions, and I'm really looking forward to hearing her lecture. That's 
still the most common way of doing this. Another very elegant way is asymmetric synthesis. And this is when you hear about natural product synthesis, people making taxol in 28 steps. This is the sort of thing we're talking about. In this group, what you do is you, you look at nature and you see what kinds of uh, building blocks nature has to offer. And you say, that's I need that particular, uh, particular functionality, so I'll take that. And you, 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 you assemble these building blocks and find some way to stitch them together to make the molecule that you want. Um, out of, out of what nature has to offer. But what we're going to talk about today is um, asymmetric analysis. And this, like I said, is a relatively new, new way of making molecules uh, in high optical activity, or making them in or pure. Um, and it has, it has advantages, and it's why the field is growing so rapidly. The, the main advantage is that um, when we do catalysis, you know, we do many turnovers. And so we get a lot of molecules for, um, for each chiral catalyst molecule that we use. We hope to get a lot of molecules. And that's a property which is called chirality multiplication. And if you look at these other um, processes uh, that we're talking about here, you can look at the product to source ratio. And if you do a resolution, the highest yield you can get without recycling is 50%. You throw away half of the starting material. When you use chiral synthons, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the molecules you started with and the molecule that you end up with. Um, and asymmetric catalysis is the only one that offers a chance to have thousands and sometimes millions of molecules made every one chiral catalyst that you have to make. And so that gives a, a big advantage, and it's why people are working uh, so much in this field in, in uh, pharmaceutical industry. So asymmetric catalysts, I'll just give a little bit of background about the field before I go into our work. Um, they're mainly homogeneous catalysts. And by overwhelmingly, the number of successful examples is, are, are in homogeneous catalysis right now. And so these are molecules. The catalysts are molecules. They're usually made up of a metal center, which is the catalytic site. Um, with some sort of a chiral ligand, and it's usually chelating and bidentate, it can be tridentate, it can grab the metal in two, at least two places or three to provide the rigidity that you need to, to uh, create the asymmetric environment. So you can draw the, the ligand, uh, you know, something like this um, cartoon. I'll just show you a few examples. One of the very earliest ligands was developed by Henri Cadan, and he's, he's really the, um, one of the pioneers in this field. He, he's the one who gave us these concepts that we now sort of second nature about chelation, about C2 symmetry, um, the things that, that, that come into play when you're designing chiral ligands. And he made this ligand dial, which, is, which was one of the very first chiroplosphine ligands. Um, Bill Knowles of Monsanto uh, also is, was a real pioneer. This ligand, which is called Dipam, is, um, was the first commercial example of a product that was used in the process to make aldopa. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But you can see in these cases that you've got the, the backbone two phosphine uh, atoms, and then the metal will sit in here and chelate, as is shown here. So another ligand that uh, probably everybody's heard of is Dyna. And this was the way Professor Takai and, and, uh, and Maori developed this ligand. And it's extremely, it's probably the most versatile of phosphine ligands. It's used for a lot of different reactions. It's, it's quite a versatile ligand. Um, it turns out that you don't have to have phosphine ligands. The early catalysts were all phosphine ligands, but there are other ways to do this chelation. And, um, to, to provide a, a good rigid chiral center. And one of the most important early examples uh, uh, of this type of, of catalyst was by Sharpless, Jerry Sharpless' uh, asymmetric epoxidation. It's actually a titanium um, dimer. The catalyst is a dimer in titanium, but this, the chiral uh, ligand is a tartrate. It's a, in this case, L-tartrate, and it chelates to the titanium, in, in this, the dimeric titanium, in this way. And that's, you know, provides a good environment for doing these catalysis. Well, I'm going to tell you, I, the title of my talk is Non-Classical Aspects of Asymmetric Catalysis. So I thought I would tell you first what I consider, what I uh, 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 define as classical asymmetric catalysis. And that is that we, we look at these molecules that we made, these, these, um, these chiral ligands and chiral catalysts, and try to, try to rationalize the anti-selectivity, the selectivity that you get in the products by looking at the interaction the substrate, the molecule you want to react, and the catalyst. And I'm just going to use an example of um, another chelated phosphine ligand. This one's going to, I'm going to show you, it's called Dufos. It was made by um, Mark Burke at DuPont some years ago. If you react that uh, with a uh, prochiral enamid, like this molecule, this is related to this L-DOPA chemistry, you get two diastereomeric intermediates. And they look like this. This is a, a, a bitmap I got from Clark Landis at um, Wisconsin. He's done a lot of work in this area. I apologize for how it looks a little bit like uh, tree branches after the first frost in Toronto. But the important part that you want to look at is 
is um, there's a rhodium atom, and then these two are the chelating two phosphine ligands in the backbone. And then this bit in blue and pink is the, um, the substrate. What you can see, if, if, if the, actually, the, the molecular mechanics that Clark did shows that this one is the minor enantiomer. Uh, this case is, is, is less stable by about 4 kcals per mole, and that's a lot in these cases. That actually says that the, um, if, you, if you have made these, these two intermediate species, you're going to have 99.9 of it present in this form uh, because, because of that difference in stability. It's because this one sort of runs into the ligands and it's, it's, not, it's not a very good fit. So the question is, in classical asymmetric catalysis, you think about this fit, and if you were an enzyme chemist, you'd say, lock and key kinetics, the good fit here is going to give us the, the product that we want. But the, the question is, is that true? Is that always the case? And that leads to what I call non-classical aspects of asymmetric catalysis. And it has to do with kinetics. Essentially, if you, uh, this is a statement that Michelle Bedard has made many times, catalysis is a kinetic phenomenon. Those pictures that we just showed show you nothing about kinetics. And this has also been said in other ways. Nayori, in talking specifically about asymmetric catalysis, said that it's, we have to consider four dimensions. There's the molecular architecture and kinetics is the fourth dimension. And if you leave one of those out, then you're, you may not get the right answer. I think actually the, the most succinct and the, the comment I like the best was made by Jeremy Knowles, who was a professor at Aldean at Harvard. And what he said is, studying the photograph of a racehorse can't tell you how fast it can run. So we need to do more than look at the pictures. We need to know something about how fast our molecules are running. So to, to illustrate that, there's a really nice case study, which is this first commercial application of asymmetric catalysis, which was to make Aldo, Bill Knowles, at um, Monsanto was responsible for the design of this ligand in this amazing process at the time. It was in the late 70s, late 60s. Concepts that were just not known when they, they did this work. And they were able to get about 99, 98% EE, and I'll define that. We, we talk about selectivity differently in these reactions. We talk about the excess. It's purely a historical definition. The excess of one enantiomer over the other. So if EE is zero, it means you have an equal amount into the, the two hands of the product. But they were able to get 98% EE in making this L-DOPA by using this chiral asymmetric uh, catalytic group. And it became the first commercial process, and it ran for at least uh, 10 years, I think. Um, and it was really quite successful. So this has been studied in great detail. Clark Landis did his PhD work with Jack Halpern on this subject. And essentially, they looked at, you saw the, the, the um, molecular modeling um, before, but this is essentially what they showed. That when you add the substrate to the catalyst, there's, a, um, there's equilibrium constants. It's, a, it's essentially a reversible binding. But one of them is present in much greater concentration than the other. But the really interesting thing that they showed, which actually the Monsanto people didn't know when they first looked at the system, but Halpern's work, this Landis and Halpern paper in, in Jax's a classic, they showed that actually the major product came from the minor intermediate. And the other, the other side of it had a much uh, slower rate to make the product. So it was really completely kinetically controlled. Um, this rate constant, the K2 on the S side, was 600 times bigger at room temperature than the K2 on the right side. And so if you thought about lock and key kinetics, you were going to get the wrong answer. And that's essentially what it came down to, a kinetic rationalization of an anti-selectivity. Lock and key kinetics can sometimes give you the wrong answer. What we need to think about is something called the curtain hammock principle, which was developed in the, in the 60s by uh, physical organic chemists. It says we have to think not only about the stability, which is what the picture shows, but also the reactivity. And this is something called the curtain hammock limit. You can look at PE, um, you can look at the rate of making the R product versus, you know, versus the rate of making the S product and relate that to EE in this way. And this essentially says that there's a, um, a ratio of the reaction, the rate constants, and a ratio of the equilibrium constants for the binding. And so one has to do with reactivity, and the other has to do with stability. And we have to consider both. And that's just a statement from Curtin's paper that says it's really the transition states that if we mix up intermediates and transition states, we can sometimes get into trouble. Intermediates are wells in an energy diagram, transition states are hills, and they may not correspond. A well may not, a low well may not correspond to a low hill. Now, that may sound familiar to you, and it really should, because this is what we in energy catalysis have talked about for years, the principle of Sabatier. Um, essentially, that you can have a correlation between the binding of a, of a substrate and its reactivity. And actually, not long after Curtin and Hammond, it's interesting to see how these things develop you know, almost simultaneously in different fields. But early work was aqua, looking at formic acid decomposition. Um, you essentially get the volcano plot. This is something you know, very characteristic of catalysis. And this is looking at a, a, essentially rain versus uh, binding, or formation of the intermediate species, heat formation of the intermediate species. If it doesn't bind strongly enough, you have low rate. If it binds too strongly, you have low rate. But if you get some 
intermediate binding in this. It uh, goes very well. And that's been discussed very, very, very nicely by Goudard in this text. But probably we know this concept best from the landmark of the Van Eyck's in the 70s on CO hydrogenation, where he showed that it can be quite complex, actually looking at the, the, the binding of two different substrates, CO and hydrogen. Sometimes they can actually compensate for each other. But you have to take into account binding and reactivity. And, um, and so just looking at, at uh, you know, you don't get the whole picture unless you look at how strongly something binds and how reactive it is. So I'm trying to convince you that kinetics are important. And, and we're looking at organic reactions. So I'll tell you a little bit about how we do kinetics on our systems. We do in situ monitoring. We're always looking at reactions. We're trying to, to ride on the reaction as it's happening, to get data as the reaction's happening. Now, these are always, almost always carried out in batch reactors, liquid phase, multi-phase reactions in batch reactors. A lot of engineers think batch reactors are passe, but um, I think that when you have a, a complex reaction, you have multi-step catalytic reaction with complex molecules, uh, the batch reactor, which has a continually changing concentration profile, is about the neatest mathematical system you can look at. And so we, essentially, if we can get really good data, we can do very good kinetic modeling, and we, we get such good data, we can actually demand a lot more of it, and we can distinguish between different kinetic models. We can do this to, for fundamental me mechanistic insight. We also do, do it for improving processes. It's a very practical approach as well. Now, the way that we do it, all the data I'm going to talk about today um, are from a technique called reaction calorimetry, which is really one of my favorites. And it's because, the reason I like it, is that um, the heat flow, the energy balance tells you that the heat flow is directly proportional to the reaction rate. And so we get a very, very accurate measure of rate directly. You don't have to take a slope, um, which you do when you do a, a concentration in time. Get every data point leaps out at you as a rate. And this is what it will look like. This is a typical heat flow curve versus time for a reaction, uh, a catalytic reaction. The rate is proportional to the heat produced or consumed in the reaction. We can get a lot out of this. You can look at that concentration profile and a kinetic profile and develop a rate law. Because that's going to be some function of substrate concentration. Michaelis Menten kinetics or something more uh, complicated. We build a mechanism uh, does not devise a rate law from that and try and test it. As a, to see if it fits the data. But this technique actually gives us other information. It gives us thermodynamic information. The area of the curve is essentially the heat of reaction. And so we can measure heats of reaction. We can compare between different reactions to make sure that we're, we're actually um, measuring what we think we are. And we can also, um, if we take a slice of that heat under, the, under the, the area of the curve and divide by the total area, we can get conversion. And so we can draw a conversion versus time plot, which is the more typical way of looking at reaction rate data that most people to see. So we get all that from this method. But one, one question that always seems to come up is, you know, people say, how do you know that you're measuring what you think you're measuring? You're just getting a heat. And I answer, when you inject into your GC, how do you know that that peak is your molecule? And the answer is your calorie. And we do that too. This is a heat flow curve for an asymmetric hydrogenation reaction. And I, as I just told you, we can turn that into um, conversion. We just take the, the partial area of the curve and we can get a conversion plot. Now we can compare this to other methods of measuring the reaction. We can take hydrogen uptake. Since it's a hydrogenation, we can also measure that as the reaction goes along. And it looks like it's in steps because the valve is opening and closing when it needs to add hydrogen. But you can see it agrees very well. And we can also take samples along the way. And so when those methods agree, you can be pretty sure that the heat flow is giving us what we need. But it gives us more than the, the GC data points. We get six or seven GC data points. We get thousands of calorimetry data. So we can do much, much more accurate modeling with those ones. But the answer is, is that we do calibrate. And we make sure that independent methods give us the same answer. At least to make sure that we don't have any side reactions going on or that we can account for any other kind of So I'm going to tell you about several different examples, uh, starting with some of my work at Merck and then ending up with some uh, new work going on at Hull today. The first example is asymmetric um, hydrogenation of a little alcohol. So this is using um, uh, uh, homogeneous cat. You take an allylic alcohol, like, like uh, shown here, generally, and we were using ruthenium binat, and this you've seen this S binat uh, before on the slide. Um, and what people had seen was that there were a lot of, um, the, the, and that just selectivity was influenced a lot by temperature and pressure. And um, Nayori basically quoted that we don't really understand why. And so we set out uh, when I was at Merck to try to understand this a little better. And that's the bottom just shows some of the complications that we had in that area. And so we looked at geranium isomers of duraniol, which is a malolic alcohol. And what we found was really interesting. There's three different isomers that we looked at. The Z and E isomers are duraniol and neural. Gamma duraniol is actually a homo alcohol, but it's an isomer as well, a double bond 
can see that the double bond is, is a terminal of the one, the gamma terminal. But there are three isomers. Three isomers, and what we saw was three different pressure effects. If we look at an anti-selectivity as a function of the pressure, we found that for geranium, E increased when we increased pressure. For gamma geranium, E decreased when we increased pressure. For neural, it doesn't matter. E stays constant for pressure. The same methods, the beginning S binary, is giving us very different.
So A, we have very good agreement between two and B. If you look at that line, again, you, your eye doesn't pick up that, that uh, induction period as well as it does if you have a direct measure of rate. The other interesting thing was that the EE changes too at the beginning of the reaction. The EE starts out low and then levels off very nicely, actually, becomes quite stable. But it's like it takes the catalyst a few turnovers to get going and doing what it really wants to do. And that was very interesting uh, to us. It was, it's also interesting in the sense that the way experiments are normally done in this field, people usually measure initial rates, and they do an achiral GC measurement for, to get a rate. So they're measuring rate here. Then they wait till the end of the reaction to take a sample to get their chiral measurement for GC, for um, EE. So you're measuring rate here and EE here, and that may not be a very valid way of the system to do that when, when something's changing. It's not just in this system. Well, the group at Merck that I left um, has worked on this since then, since I left, and they've done some very nice work. Young Hui Sun, who was a student of Henry Weinberg's when he was at Caltech, and he was a surface scientist. Henry Weinberg's a loving tour, so he definitely has crossed the pressure now. And he um, basically saw something that Glosser had commented on earlier, but he showed it very nicely um, that, that both the E and rate show a maximum at a certain number of platinum atoms on the surface that you need for this chiral site to do the, the, um, you know, the modifier has to take up. And so we're back to the volcano plots. Um, essentially, rate and E show maximum. And, um, and if you work, if you can work at that maximum, at that, at that concentration of the alpha wave modifier, um, you can get extremely good selectivity. You, you get, they got, essentially got close to the highest CD ever reported. And they did it at, at uh, very low pressure. These curves are at 5.8 bar, but they also did it close to one atmosphere. And that's, a, that's one atmosphere is actually two orders of magnitude lower pressure than what Previously, they reported that you need to get high EE. People thought you had to go to 100 atmospheres of pressure. And that's very good news for pharmaceutical companies because in batch reactors, you don't want to go to 100 bar. You can avoid it. So they showed this, and it was very nice. But the problem is there's a, there's a catch, and that is that it's very hard to maintain that optimal surface. When they use acetic acid as a salt, which is acetic acid is the best salt in this reaction because it gives you the highest EE. But the good news and bad news, the bad news is it chews up the modifier. So most people put in too much modifier. Um, they didn't know this is why, but this explains it quite well. You put in too much and it chews up some of it, so by the end of the reaction you still have some left. But you never are at the maximum, or you're very briefly at the maximum for rate and EE. You don't actually run under optimum conditions. They found that if you try to run the reaction under the optimal surface conditions, the EE just dies in the first reaction because it gets chewed up. You see the gas and just heats it up. So um, they devised a very clever way around this, and that is to add the modifier over time. If you add, they basically calculate how much modifier and when to start adding. And if you start adding modifier about halfway through the reaction, in a little slow, steady stream, you can keep that IE over the whole course of the reaction. And now I think other groups have started to use the same kind of protocol, but it's, uh, it's a way of, of getting extremely high in anti selectivity and essentially using what you know about the, the system, the, the mechanism and the, the surface chemistry uh, to get there. Well, another thing that we did when I was still at work was to look at, um, uh, again, on the line of pressure effects, we looked at um, stirring speeds, the effect of stirring speed on these reactions. And we, what we saw was the reaction looked at low stirring speeds, it looked like it was zero order kinetics in substrate. And then that changed as you went up to higher um, stirring speeds. You can see zero order kinetics sort of bending, and then finally breaking out and giving us essentially what's really the true kinetics of the reaction, which is positive order kinetics in substrate. That's all done at the same pressure. The only thing we changed was the stirring speed. So that suggests that the, the zero order kinetics is not valid. It's actually mass transfer that they committed. And a lot of people, when they see in organic chemistry, when they see zero order kinetics, they say, well, that's saturation kinetics, very strong binding in the substrate. And in this case, that would be the wrong answer, because this reaction, you can see it clearly doesn't want to be zero order kinetics. And so what we saw was, was zero order kinetics for a, a different reason, because of a competing rate process. Getting hydrogen into the, into the, the solution was the, was the slow step. So essentially, if we did this at constant pressure, but what it suggests is that the, the catalyst, when, this, when you're stirring at very low stirring speed, the catalyst never saw that pressure. It saw some pressure much lower than that, some lower effective pressure. So that suggests if there's a pressure effect on the EE, there's probably a stirring speed effect on the EE as well. And that's what we saw. Essentially, that um, the x-axis shows agitation speeds, the same as on the last slide. It shows you what the EE did um, as a function of agitation speed. Constant pressure. Every reaction was done at the same pressure. So it suggests that you can only use pressure as a handle on a concentration of hydrogen if you're not diffusion So you've got to make sure that your stirring speed is high enough that you're not diffusion before you can actually talk about pressure as a kinetic variable. And it's
this hydrogen, concentration of hydrogen at the catalyst site, it's actually genetically meaningful. And so this again is a, is a, um, a case where we've got uh, you know, pathways. This, this, in this case, we've got a pathway which is competing outside the catalytic cycle. And so you can actually um, uh, you know, change, the, change what you see by, by uh, slowing or speeding up a pathway which is, is external to the catalytic cycle. So that's the end of that, uh, that is it. And I'm going to go on to some work that we've done, that I've done since moving to Germany first and now in Holland. Um, and it's an area which is probably not very familiar to most people here. It's called, the area, the topic is called nonlinear effects in asymmetric catalysis. And since that's probably not familiar, first I'll explain what a linear effect in asymmetric catalysis is. Um, sometimes the catalyst that you use is not 100% the left hand or 100% the right hand. Sometimes it's hard to make a catalyst completely an anterior pier. If it's not an anterior pier, normally you assume that it's just going to be a, a, a linear, it's going to, the E that you get is going to be based on those two catalysts that you have in the mixture. For example, if you have a catalyst which makes, if, it, if it's an anti-appear, let's just say, for example, that it makes an anti-appear product, then you would assume that if the catalyst was if racemic, it would make a racemic product. So if you have a 50% EE catalyst, you would assume that the EE of the product would be 50%. And that's why most things get, it's completely proportional to what, you know, each catalyst does its own thing and gives you, you know, the answer based on the mixture. But sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes you get something that's not linear. That line is, essentially shows you the linear case that we just talked about. It's a straight line. If you plot E of the product that you're getting versus E of the catalyst. There have been cases um, where seen where the E that you get is actually less than the E of the catalyst, the less than you would predict. And the other side is that it can be more. You can essentially, you can get a uh, higher E than, um, than what the catalyst, than the E of the catalyst would have predicted. And that's been termed asymmetric
that's a part of the question that we want to work on. That part. How did you go from this small imbalance to this great imbalance that we have now? And it's been suggested that catalysis might be related. So catalysis can be involved in, in some very important uh, basic questions about what. Um, and the, the kind of reaction that's been suggested to do this would be an autocatalytic reaction as a means by which we could amplify this initial imbalance. Now, 10 years ago, when I talked about autocatalytic reactions, um, uh, it, was, it was to do with General Motors and rhodium and three-way catalysts. And they supported my PYI and we did a lot of work on autocatalysis. But this is a different autocatalysis. This is where the catalyst is the product. And this is probably harder for uh, heterogeneous people to think about because our catalysts are not molecules, they're surfaces. But if your catalyst is a molecule, there's no reason why the, the product, I mean, the product is a molecule also. So there are reactions now that are autocatalytic. Essentially, you take two, you put A plus B and use a catalyst and you make that catalyst. So if, if you can do that, that's, a, 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 if we, there's, a, I'll discuss how that could um, have been uh, important in amplifying the EE. So essentially, let's, let's look at this, how we might do this amplification. Because it's not completely simple, but let's say we have an autocatalytic reaction. So we have a small imbalance. We have something we're going to call major and minor. We have some R catalyst and some S catalyst. They can each do the reaction, okay? What we want to do, and they make themselves, okay? The R catalyst makes R and it makes some S. The S makes S and it makes some R. So, because most reactions are not perfect. You don't get all R from the R catalyst. It actually does make some mistakes and makes S. What we want is for the R catalyst to keep making R. What we don't want is for the S catalyst to make S. Because if it keeps making S, we're sunk. We can't amplify. We're going to end up, ultimately, you can show this mathematically, you're going to be a racemic mixture. It's just the way, there's no way around it, unless you have a way to inhibit this S catalyst from making itself. So the requirement, if we want to explain this amplification, is that we have to find a way to decrease the, the, the minor enantiomer, this S. And one way to do it would be to get to, um, to sequester it in some way. If we make a dimer, we, take, we sacrifice some of our major R to essentially sequester this S into an RS dimer, a heterochiral dimer, which is inactive. It's just a sink to get rid of the bad molecule, the S that we don't like. That can explain how we could um, amplify chirality. Because what would happen then is that we basically prevent, by putting the S over here, we prevent it from going back around and making more of itself. And so then, the only process which is making more of itself is the R, or the major process, say. So the amplification can be possible if we have some inhibition mechanism. That's the thing to keep in mind, inhibition. And one way of thinking about it is a reservoir of inactive heterochiral dimers. So this was actually recognized, uh, this idea of inhibition was recognized in the 1950s. A guy named Frank wrote a theoretical paper, and he said essentially what I said on the last slide. He said, if you have a way, a catalyst which can make more of itself and not and prevent its, its uh, you know, mirror image from being made, this is a sufficient model to explain life, life as we know it. And then he made a comment, which, was, um, which is what intrigued everybody and has for 50 years. He said, a laboratory demonstration may not be impossible. And this really, uh, a lot of, there's a lot of people in, uh, in Europe have worked on this problem. And the guy, Hans Lindbergh in, in Holland, was a scientist who worked on this a lot. And he wrote a review later, in the, in the late 80s, and he said, now that comment was a challenge to any red blood accounts. <laughs> a laboratory demonstration may not be impossible. And so people searched for this kind of reaction for years. He searched for this, a lot of people did. But it wasn't until 1995 that the first verification of this kind of reaction came out. And it came from Japan, Kenzo Zoli. And the, the work is just, people just were, um, it was just mind-boggling what he showed. And the reaction is this. This is chemistry that might look very strange, but it's a pyrimidal aldehyde. It's an alkylation reaction. Dialkylase chemistry is well known. It's an extremely common way of, of making a carbon-carbon bond in the pharmaceutical industry. But you take diisotropal zinc and you make this alkoxide and finally you quench it to this alcohol. So you've actually added a diisopropyl or one isopropyl group to the aldehyde and made it to an alcohol and, and obviously you can do this in high E if you've got a chiral template. But he put in that alcohol in very low E and he got it out in high E. He did this in an amazing way. He took a racemic mixture of secondary butanol or something, showed certain polarized light at it, made a tiny imbalance, 0.05% E, used that to initiate this reaction. He got 84% EE product. It, it, it was, you know, it, it had every, took everybody's breath away. He also used quartz, used inorganic materials to initiate the reaction. This got everybody excited, because in the prebiotic soup, what, we probably had a lot of inorganic things like quartz. And if you had, a, if, if one over here was a little bit, had a small EE, maybe this is how life started. But the thing 
people have this reaction. Since 95, he's been showing a lot of cases of this, um, all similar to this, but no mechanism. No, no fate and nothing. No thinking about how did this happen? What's the mechanism? How, you know, what, how is this working? So that's what we decided to work on. And I work, um, this is a collaboration with John Brown at Oxford. Um, when I first started, I got a grant to study this, but I didn't have any students yet. So he sent up an undergraduate, mainly, and then two postdocs, but mainly the work done by a, a part two undergraduate um, from Oxford, but now an investment banker. I'm not sure what <laughs> Essentially, take we call one the aldehyde, and then we've got the, um, the dialpose. Two is the catalyst, and it's the product. And this is what the data look like. This is from heat flow data in my new small calorimeter, which is we do reactions on a two milliliter scale. So heat flow versus time looks like that. We did it for three cases: an NTO pure two, this molecule two, and we did it when it was racemic, and we did it with, with, when it was 43 percent E. 43 percent E looks like that. Racemic looks like that. And it's classic autocatalytic behavior. If you model that, it's exactly rate time, rate is this concentration times this concentration times this multiplied by a K. So it's classic autocatalytic behavior. If you look at, you can see it best with receiving. The rate goes up because you're making catalysts, but then of course the rate has to fall because you run out of substrate. So it's perfect autocatalysis. But if you look at this, those rates are not the same, right? And we put in the same amount, the same mole percent of the two. The only difference was that they weren't all the same EE. So that's actually good, because that suggests an inhibition process, which is what we need for amplification. The fact that they don't all have the same peak height suggests that we are um, inhibiting when we have racemic or when we have not an pure catalyst. So then, if you look at this rate law um, and look at this, this plot, you see that um, if you're a geneticist, you don't plot things this way, because rate laws don't have time. Time is hidden. Time is hidden in rate. But over here on this side, is only concentrations. So we really want to plot versus some, some measure of concentration conversion. So that's what we do. We plot this versus fraction conversion. And if you look at the anti-pure case, it looks like that. It's, it's again, it's classic autocatalysis. But then when I decided to put these together, I did something else. I, I took these three curves and I normalized the peak height. So I divided this one by 200, this by 180, this by 110, just to have them all go up to one at the maximum. And so when I did that, that's what the 43% E looks like. It's shifted over a little bit. Um, uh, and if I, the, the really interesting thing to watch is this. That's the receiver. It falls directly on top of the enantiopia. Now this, I, it, it, this, I'm going to probably have to go through this really quickly, but it took me a month. I sat and looked at that and thought, why is that? that is, why did that not make sense to me? I'll try to explain both of those things to you. Because they fall on top of each other, the only way that can happen is if the ratio of rates for making the antipure and the receiving cat stay the same throughout the reaction. The 43% E is different, but the antipure and the receiving, when you make more two, you make it in the same ratio. You start out with two molecules to four to eight, or one to two to four in those two cases. And that's I, that, and the reason that that's unusual is that we were, the model that we were talking about for inhibition, it doesn't fit with that. Remember we said, we have an S cat and an R cat. We need to pull away. It's like, you think, when I, I show a lot of slides with reaction arrows, think of those as springs, like Hooke's Law springs. You pull harder one way or another. We have to pull some away to this uh, inactive, to an inactive heterochiral dimer in order to get amplification here. But if you can make the heterochiral dimer, you also have to allow for having a homochiral dimer. And so now we've got arrows pulling in two directions. Now, the thing is, we make more catalysts. We're making the, the monomers, the S and the R. That's the products of the reaction. But they're going to partition themselves into these dimers. And their rule, their law for how they partition themselves are K homo for the um, SS and the RR. They have the same partitioning rule. And K hetero for this one. Now, to get amplification, we have to pull harder down to the heterocouple dimer. You have to have a higher K hetero than K homo. K hetero has to be bigger than K homo. But that last slide I showed you, where the rates are proportional, the only way that can happen is if they're equal. If you think about that for a minute, let's say we have the, the homochiral case. We only have the, let's say the enantiopure um, catalyst. It only has one K. It's, it's essentially making mainly uh, S catalysts like that. But with receiving case, we've got both of those. The only way those, the rates of making these two, or the, the rate of the concentrations of these two staying is in proportion over the course of the reaction, would be if K hetero equals K homo. So we have two pieces of experimental information that are contradictory. So how do we reconcile that, that conclusion? One says that they have to be different, one says they have to be the same. And the way that we can do that, our problem is this, this, this um, monomer dimer equilibrium. That's what's given us the problem. We've got two different K 
case to worry about. Well, what if we don't? What if, what if the system was completely driven towards dimer formation so that kinetically we never see monomers? As soon as you make a monomer, it becomes a dimer. Now we have a system where we only have one K to worry about. And that takes care of this system, this model. If we have dimers, the dimers themselves are the catalysts. That can explain both. Then, then we can have the, the proportional rates for an antiopure and racemic, and a, and a rate which is not proportional for the non-antiopure. Anything between an antiopure and racemic will give you a different rate of proportion as it goes along in the reaction. So that's a model that actually can, can fit both of our pieces of data. So how, how does that look? Um, well, you can do more than just say, okay, now that's a good model. We can actually use our data now and try to fit it and see what we get. What does it tell us about the system? And so there's two things we want to ask. We're back to the same question. We want to know how stable those dimers are relative to each other. How, how much of the heterochiral dimer do we make compared to the other two? And, you know, so we want to know this K. This K tells us this, essentially the stability, the equilibrium constant between those to, to make those dimers. And we want to know how active they are. We hope that this guy is not active as a catalyst because he's going to make racemic product. And we don't want that. So we hope he's less active than those guys. So essentially, we can fit this model. This is actually identical to a model that Kagan developed years ago for this whole area of nonlinear effects. It's called the ML2 model. It has two parameters, K dimer, which is just the, um, the, the heterochiral dimer squared divided by the two heterochiral dimers multiplied together. That tells us the equilibrium constant, the distribution between those dimers at any E of the catalyst. And then there's another parameter we call G, which says how active is this compared to this? So the, these two have the same activity, the two homochiral um, but if this number is less than one, then we have um, a less active he heterochiral dimer. It, it could be a catalyst, but we hope it's less active as a catalyst. So we can actually look at our, we've got great data. We can actually look at that. We can fit our experimental data to the kinetic model and use that to predict EE as the reaction goes on. For that 43% EE case, the reaction was am amplifying as it went along. It, and we want to see if we can predict that. You notice I haven't shown you any EE data. On top. I've only talked about rate data. And I'm going to use rate data to predict the EE. So for that catalyst that was 43% EE to start with, um, at the beginning of the reaction, this is what the model says it should do over time. And it gave us K equals 4 and G equals 0. And um, so the next thing to do is obviously to think about the experiment data, because we took samples as well. So we know what the EE did over time. That's a prediction from the rate data. So if our EE data look anything like that, it's a completely independent test of the model, because they're completely independent experiments. That's what the data did, the real data. So it fit really well. And that was great. I mean, that always feels good if you predict something and then it's borne out by experiment. But there's something else that's even more important here. And, um, and it's these numbers, k equals 4 and g equals 0. When I did that modeling, it jumped up. And I said to my husband, k equals 4 and g equals 0. And he gave me the same blank look that you guys are giving me. <laughs> but um, it's actually extremely important. That's what I hope. That if you don't take anything else away, just take this away. I'll take the next few slides to, to explain that. What K equals 4 is, it's the statistical distribution of dimers. Essentially, if an R, you make an R catalyst monomer. If it finds, immediately it's going to make a dimer. If it finds an R, it makes an R. If it, makes, if it finds an S, it makes an RS. It doesn't care. It has no preference. Whereas in most of the cases of nonlinear effects, you're trying to develop a very strong preference. When you have that monomer dimer equilibrium, you needed a strong preference for making the heterochiral dimer. G equals 0, so that's what K equals 4 tells. G equals zero says that it's completely inactive, which is what we need. We don't want it going around making the same product. We won't amplify the E as well. But it's this random statistical dimer formation that I want you to keep in mind. So we have other evidence for this. Molecular modeling, John Brown has done, essentially shows that's what the two dimers look like. Uh, it's not critical, but it's nice to show. You know, it's, it essentially shows that they, there is no bias and stability between the two. NMR also shows if you take a, an antiopure mixture, you get one nice piece. If you take a receiving mixture, you get two peaks of equal concentration. And that says essentially the statistical distribution is one for a receiving mixture is one RR, one SS, two RS. The RR and SS are the same. So that's one peak at, at, a, at a count of two, and there's another one at a count of two. Two equal peaks. So it, it fits with what the kinetics told us. Now the question is why is this so important? Why do I get excited about K equals four? Well, we're back to the question that we wanted to answer, and that is, we're talking about how we could have had spontaneous asymmetric synthesis via autocatalysis at the beginning of the world in the prebiotic suit. Today, when we do this, we make elegant patents. People who do this stuff make, it's a triumph. They design incredible architecture.
structure, and they, um, you know, chemistry and engineering together to make these three-dimensional uh, catalysts, which um, usually are heavily biased. In these cases, they're heavily biased towards, you know, making a, a lot more of the inactive diamond. But that kind of technology that we use now to make really good chiral catalysts probably wasn't available in the prebiotic suit. I mean, we had very small molecules finding each other and doing things randomly, right? So randomly, that's what K equals 4 for us, randomly. So what, what did we have in the prebiotic pool? We had, um, you know, the life as we know it today, basically it couldn't rely on this elegant chemistry that we do today. Because we have templates already, we can do more elegant chemistry. What happened when we didn't have templates? Life on Earth today had to rely simply on statistics, having equal stability of the, of the dimer species. And one stroke of luck is that the, the, the uh, heterochiral dimer was not, active, was not as active. So we're, again, we're back to stability and activity. Unequal uh, activity equals stability. So essentially, the, the, just to summarize that, uh, it was quite exciting to me that it was the kinetics that really led us to this. The kinetics helped us to provide a, a mechanism for the amplification which has been observed in cell ice reaction, which nobody really understood. And then, from that, we're, we're able to propose a model which, make, to me, makes a lot of sense for how, um, how we could have arrived at the homochirality we have today from a very, very simple model that doesn't require um, a lot of uh, predestination uh, to get to where we are today. So that is a little different than the first examples, but really, what I'm trying to say is very similar. And it's, um, in all the examples, what we have to do is combine what people call classical and what I call non-classical aspects. Um, we have to think about stability of the species, and that has to do with the architecture in three dimensions and ground state structures. But we also have to think about reactivity, and that means competing reaction pathways, you know, how do you enhance one over another, and what are really what we have to get at are transition state structures. We can never measure those. We have to, have, we have to use reactivity information to tell us about them. And it's the interplay between those that we really have to think about. And all of Every, all the examples, from the very practical to this sort of more esoteric meaning of life uh, example, uh, have to do with that, that question. Stability versus activity, and the interplay between the two, and, and consider all of those. So that's, that's actually the end, and I uh, just want to make some acknowledgments. The work I talked about today, um, the first two examples were done um, when I was at work, uh, in collaboration with Seton Hall, Professor John So and, and uh, Bob Augustine. And I just want to again mention Young Bai Sun at work. He runs the group that I left, and it's a, um, they're just they're great things. So they're showing you in, in very practical ways and very fundamental ways what you can do, uh, the richness of kinetics in these, uh, in these uh, uh, organic reactions. Uh, at Oxford, John Brown, Chris McMill, and Shailish uh, Ramadil was also quite important in the work I just showed you. And the funding, I want to just mention um, Pfizer, because uh, Pfizer's the research has been extremely generous to me. They, they uh, support my work. Completely unrestricted, let me do whatever I want, and, and it's been a great relationship. Um, I just want to also mention um, my group now at all, these are the names of people that are, and I'm still building it. Somebody told me I could put in a plug for postdocs if I wanted to, so I still have at least two positions that I'm trying to fill. Um, and also, a lot of my work over the last few years has been in collaboration with a lot of, a lot of people and um, a lot of good organic chemists. Um, some of this is, is ongoing and some of it is uh, work that's already finished, but this is just a list of a lot of the people that I collaborate with. The uh, last thing I want to say is um, I just want to mention, I, I mentioned John Bradley here in a professional sense as a collaborator, but um, he's also my husband. And uh, he couldn't be here because our eight-year-old is still in school. Um, so he's at home uh, right now with my son. And um, I just have to say that uh, without his uh, unflagging support, they're both of them, they're unflagging support. So I just said thank you.